Um, in today's lecture, we continue to talk about scoring rules as proposed by the Chevalier de Bordas and Condorcet extensions, which go back to the Marquis de Condorcet. And um, in today's lecture, we want to investigate to which extent these two ideas um, from Bordas and Condorcet are compatible with each other. And I think we have some quite nice material to cover. So let's just quickly recap what we did last time. So last time I introduced the class of scoring rules and also the more refined class of composed scoring rules. And we characterized this class um, using this reinforcement axiom, which is a, a very nice and, and elegant characterization of scoring rules. And in today's lecture, we will talk about the conflict between the ideas of, of Border and Condorcet. And um, in the second half, we will talk about a so-called social preference function, um, in particular Kemeny's rule, and this is a very interesting function both from an axiomatic point of view and also from a computational point of view, and we are going to continue to talk about Kemeny's rule in, uh, in the next week. Um, so this is the last slide we had last week. So the, the family of scoring rules is pretty much straightforward. So Borda's rule is one example of this, but there are many other scoring rules, but it's easily understood. The family of Condorcet extensions, as I said last week, is much richer. So there are many different ideas that you can develop if you want to have a Condorcet extension from very simple ones like Copeland's rule, um, where you just look at the degree of the vertices if you look at the majority graph, uh, to somewhat more complicated ones like, like Young's rule, for instance, which is a C3 function. Um, which, for example, is difficult to compute. And since this, uh, this family of Condorcet extensions is so rich, uh, I gave you this hierarchy of different functions um, called C1, C2, and C3 functions to get more structure into, these, into this family of uh, social choice functions. All right. Um, now, as I said, so we first want to look at to which extents the ideas of Border and Condorcet are compatible with each other. So first, if we only have two alternatives, and you're probably not surprised by this, then everything is fine. So we know in general, and I mentioned this a couple of times already, that social choice for two alternatives is easy and simple, and majority rule does the job. Um, and this is also the case if you look at it from the perspective of scoring rules and Condorcet extensions. Um, well, if you have only two alternatives, um, well, th there are different score vectors, but you can normalize those and they will all give you the same function, which is majority rule, um, as, as long as you want to have monotonic scoring rules. And there's only a single Condorcet extension, which is just majority rule, which means to pick the majority preferred alternative. So on two alternatives, the ideas of Border and Condorcet coincide, unsurprisingly. Now, if you move on to more than two alternatives, it turns out that with already three alternatives, um, the ideas of Border and Condorcet are incompatible with each other um, because it can be shown, and this is what Condorcet showed more than 200 years ago, 250 years ago, um, he showed that Border's rule is no Condorcet extension whenever there are at least three alternatives. And that means there are preference profiles in which Border's rule selects an alternative. Uh, so there are preference profiles in which there is a Condorcet winner, and Border's rule fails to select this alternative. So Border's rule picks a different alternative. Um, and this is somewhat interesting because it seems, if you look at the old writings of, of Bordas, where he introduced Bordas' rule, it seems like he was aware of the Condorcet criterion and, and used it in his paper, and he probably even thought that Bordas' rule does satisfy the Condorcet criterion until Condorcet um, wrote his pamphlet in which he pointed out that Bordas' rule violates this property. Um, and that I'm going to show you here. So there are many preference profiles for which this is the case. Um, I'm not showing you the one that, that Condorcet himself used, which of course is uh, unnecessarily complicated, um, but there's a rather simple one which only uses five voters, and it looks like this. So we have three voters which have the preference relation ABC, and two voters with the preference relation BCA. Okay, now first, uh, which alternative is the Condorcet winner in this preference profile, if there is one? You can just shout it in if you see the Condorcet winner, even without drawing the majority graph. So it's in this case, it's particularly simple. You don't need to look at the graph. Yes? B is the Condorcet winner? Well, it's, it seems like a majority of voters prefers A to B, right? So three out of five voters prefer A to B? Yes? Exactly. So, so A is the Condorcet winner because 
Well, well, this column, so this subset of voters already is a majority of voters. And if a majority of voters thinks that one alternative agrees on the best alternative, then this alternative has to be a Condorcet winner. So it's, that's why I meant it's a simple case of a Condorcet winner, because a majority of, of the voters thinks A is best, so they prefer it to B and to C. So A is the Condorcet winner here. Okay, so maybe let's mark it somehow. So A is the Condorcet winner. And now if we look at the border winner, so the, um, so it's pretty obvious that C is, doesn't really have a chance uh, of being selected by border rules. So probably we only need to compare the border scores of A and B. So the border score of A would be which number? Again, you can just shout it in if you know. Six, right? And the border score of B? Seven. Right, okay, so it's two times three plus one, so the border score of B is seven, and therefore this example shows that borders rule picks an alternative which is different from the Condorcet winner. Okay, so and this was basically the start of this conflict between border and Condorcet. So Condorcet said that every social choice function has to select a Condorcet winner whenever one exists, and the rule that border proposed doesn't satisfy this property. And um, we will generalize this conflict much further in this lecture by uh, by more generally studying which rules that have the same flavor as, bo as, as, as borders rule, for instance, uh, scoring rules in general, or maybe even more general rules that satisfy reinforcement, which is the defining property of scoring rules, to which extent these rules are compatible with um, the principle by Condorcet. Okay, so yeah, but this is a simple example that is quite useful. So it's, it's almost, so I, whenever we encounter this Condorcet profile I mentioned, so this is the same old example that we keep using over and over again. And I think this is a similar kind of, of example because um, it's a very classic one where, where Borders rule fails to be Condorcet consistent. Okay, now, as I said, so we want to generalize this further. Um, so maybe other scoring rules are Condorcet extensions, right? So we. For instance, already know that plurality rule is not a Condorcet extension because I, I gave you an example in the very first lecture um, where plurality se selects a different winner than the Condorcet winner, um, and there are many examples where this is the case. But in principle, it might still be possible that there are scoring rules that satisfy this Condorcet consistency condition. It turns out that this is not the case, and we are also proving the statement here. Um, so here it turns out, in, in general, because the way we define scoring rules, they also allow for non-monotonic scoring rules. Um, so these can be covered by these cases here. I'm not going into details because that's really just a, a bit boring and, and unnatural to think about non-monotonic scoring rules. But if a, if a scoring rule is non-monotonic on three alternatives, it has to be the case that either S2 is greater than S1 or S3 is greater than S2. And for both of these cases, we can find simple examples where there is a border winner different, um, where there is a scoring rule winner um, that is different from the Condorcet winner. Okay, so the more interesting case is the one for monotonic scoring rules, and that's the one that I'm covering here. And the nice thing here is that this is a universal example, which um, only uses 11 voters, and, and this is also the minimal number of voters in, uh, that is necessary in order to prove this statement. So we found this example using a computer. I think the previous general example of this kind, which was found by Peter Fishburne, used 17 voters, if I'm not mistaken. Um, okay, so now what we want to show by means of this example here is that every, every scoring rule um, picks an alternative that is different from the Condorcet winner. Okay, so maybe first let's check that this profile has a Condorcet winner in the first place. Right? So let's try to draw this, or maybe use black here, the majority relation. Okay, so if we now we have to make these pairwise comparisons uh, between A, B, and C, because here it's not completely obvious which alternative could be a Condorcet winner. So is the majority in favor of A or B, if you compare just B and A? Um, okay, so B, right? So all these voters here prefer B, so we have an edge from B to A. Okay, always recall that edges are going from the majority preferred to the, um, to the other alternative. Okay, and then um, between B and C, so it turns out that the majority prefers C to B, right? So 
that's uh, six voters versus five voters. So it's a tiny majority, but it's still a majority who prefers C to B. Okay, and between C and A, we have that, um, again, six voters prefer C to A, and five voters prefer A to C, so it's still a majority. Okay, so that means that in this example, um, maybe let's l use the same color for Condorcet winners, alternative C is a Condorcet winner. Okay, now the claim is that um, for any monitoring scoring rule, this rule will select an alternative different from alternative C. And it turns out that for this example, all of these monotonic scoring rules will choose exactly the same alternative, no matter what the score vector looks like. And, and to see this, the first thing we need to realize is that, I think I mentioned it last time already, is that we can use a positive affine transformation on the score vector to, to normalize the score vector. And this makes things simpler, because in principle, if we have three alternatives, there are these three numbers here that define a scoring rule. So the number that we assign to the first rank, to the second rank, rank and to the third rank. And so maybe let's just write down the score vector here, S1, S2, S3. And this we can just normalize, okay? Because uh, we can just subtract S3 from all of these scores so that the last one becomes zero. And then we can just divide everything by S1. And then we have normalized it such that we give a score of 1 to the first ranked alternative, a score of, let's just call this number S, um, to the second rank, and 0 to the last rank. Okay, and S is between 0 and 1. Yes? Uh, yes. That's right. Yes, that's right. Thanks. Um, okay, so S is between 0 and 1. Okay, so this normalization is hopeful. so we could so I think on the in, in the last lecture I said that we can have we can multiply something with alpha and then just add beta so you can find alpha and beta um, for which this is the case and then we have just normalized the score vector through this one here and this defines exactly the same scoring rule and the nice thing is is that that means that if we have three alternatives a scoring rule is completely defined by a single number. Okay, so for for borders rule for instance, what would this number be? What would S be if we have borders rule? I didn't hear it. Yes, half, one half, right? Okay. Um, and then, for instance, for plurality, it would be zero. For anti-plurality, it would be one. And any any scoring rule you can think of is just defined by the single number S here. Okay, and, th and that just makes the computation a bit easier. Um, because now what we want to do is we want to compute the scores of the three alternatives. Okay, so... Um, the score of alternative A is just the number of times alternative A is top ranked, which would be which number? So how many times is A top ranked? <laughs> Two times, right? And then we have to check how many times A is um, second ranked, and that's three times, so we have three times S. And, well, then... Um, for the last rank, actually, we can just ignore this because we are just assigning score zero here. So, so let's forget about the last rank because we only get a score of zero. And now we need to do the same thing for the other alternatives. Okay, so for B, that would be five times top ranked plus four S. Okay, so hope you're all following um, because it's really just calculating the numbers here. And for C, it's four times top ranked plus um, four times second rank. Okay, so these are the score of the three alternatives depending on this number S, because, because we don't know what the scoring rule is. Um, but now, if you compare those numbers, um, you will see that no matter what S is, so, so the only thing we know about S is that it's between zero and one, right? And no matter what S is, B will have the highest score, right? Because 4 plus 5s is always larger than 4 plus 4s, no matter what s is. And this is, both of these are definitely larger than 2 plus 3s. Um, so in other words, we have that the score of B is strictly larger than the score of C, 
which is strictly larger than the score of A. Well, and hence, now let's again use the same color. Alternative B is the scoring rule winner, no matter what the scoring rule is. So alternative B is the plurality winner. Okay. It's the anti-plurality winner, it's the border winner. So for all scoring rules, you can think of an infinite number of them. The scoring rule winner will always be B. And that's why this is a universal proof of the statement that no scoring rule, so we just did the case for monotonic scoring rules here, um, is the Condorcet extension whenever there are at least three alternatives. Okay, so I think that that's a very nice and, in, well, maybe not insightful because it's not clear how you can come up with this preference profile here, but um, so last time I mentioned that maybe if you're interested, you can check whether Borders rule is a Condorcet extension. Maybe some of you did and hopefully relatively quickly realized that there are profiles like this one here where the border winner is different from the Condorcet winner. Um, there are, of course, many other profiles where this is the case. Um, by the way, so for both of these statements, M, we, we just not say that M is equal to three, but M is at least three. So if, if we have more alternatives, we can do the same trick as we did before. We can just add additional alternatives at the bottom of the preference profile. Um, and then those will have a lower border score, of course, than all the other alternatives, and that will not change the Condorcet winner. Okay, so for, for C to be a Condorcet winner in this preference profile here, C needs to majority dominate all the other alternatives. And if we add additional ones at the bottom of the preference profile, well, of course, they are majority dominated. They are even Pareto dominated. All right. Um, OK, so that proves the statement that not only Borders rule is incompatible with the Condorcet principle, but every scoring rule is. OK. Um, Now, um, before we look deeper at this incompatibility, so there are some, some general statements I would like to make about Borders rule. Um, so some of, some of these you have seen in the current exercises. So first thing that is somewhat obvious if you think about how border, border scores are defined. So Borders rule is the rule that picks the alternatives with the highest average rank. Right, because the scoring vector is just equidistant, so it's just the same difference between each of the ranks. So you take the alternative which has uh, alternatives, it could be several of them, which have the highest average rank. So this makes Borders rule quite practical. And as I said, uh, the Chevalier de Bordard was really a practical person. So if you look at the preference profile, sometimes you can even see that an alternative is the border winner, because if you look at where, when it is placed first, uh, second, and third, so if you try to see the average rank, it's, it's in some cases relatively obvious that one alternative has highest average rank. Um, then there's a theorem by Smith from the 70s, which I believe was exactly a, an exercise on the, on the previous exercise sheet. So a Condorcet winner is never the alternative with the lowest border score. Okay, so e even though the, idea of borders and, uh, of the ideas of border and Condorcet are incompatible, it turns out that borders rule um, among scoring rules um, does pretty well because a Condorcet winner is never the alternative which has the lowest uh, border score. So the, it's, it's not that uh, like what Condorcet says is the best alternative can be the worst alternative uh, according to what Border says. And it turns out, and this uh, can be shown, and I think you did it in the exercise, that Border's rule is the only scoring rule for which this is the case. Also, you can rephrase this statement, and the proof is, is almost exactly the same. You can say that um, a Condorcet loser, which I don't think we have defined yet. That's why I put the definition on the slide here. So there's just an alternative that loses every pairwise majority comparison. And a Condorcet lo loser is never the alternative with the highest border score. OK, so it, that just means that the border ranking and, um, and the, the Condorcet ranking, if there is something like this, um, do not um, completely disagree with each, with, with each other. Um, and then this is also quite an interesting theorem by, by Gerlein et al, um, who has shown that under the assumption that all preference relations are equally likely, so sometimes when you make statistical statements in social choice, you need to know which distribution you are talking about. So how are the preference profiles distributed? And one of the most basic assumptions, I think we mentioned it earlier when we talked about the likelihood of a Condorcet winner, is just that every preference relation is equally likely. So you just store preference relations for each of the voters. And it turns out that under this assumption, Borders rule is the scoring rule which maximizes the probability that a Condorcet winner is chosen whenever one exists. Okay? So that means 
Again, the ideas of scoring rules and, and, uh, and the Condorcet principle are incompatible with each other, but among the class of scoring rules, Borders rule actually does best in selecting Condorcet winners whenever they exist. And here's just an interesting historical fact. Um, so, as I mentioned last time, so both Border and Condorcet were members of the French Academy of Sciences. And uh, Borda proposed his rule to the French Academy of Sciences in 1770, um, and it was then used there for 20 years until it was um, replaced by Napoleon, Bonap Na Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, who replaced it with a rule of his own. Unfortunately, it's unknown which rule that was. Um, probably something worse than Borda's rule, I'm not sure. So it's, uh, nobody knows. Um, so one the general theme that we would like to follow, at least for today's lecture, is, is that it would be nice to somehow unify the ideas of Border and Condorcet. Yes? Okay. Okay, so the idea of the Gerland theorem is that, um, so we look at, so we have a distribution of preference profiles, okay? And that, that because this is a statement about a probability. Okay, so we, we say that um, the preference profiles are distributed in the sense that each voter just picks a ranking of the alternatives and all rankings there are equally likely. So for instance, if you have three alternatives, then each of these six rankings is equally likely. And if we draw preference profiles at random, um, then we just draw one of these six preference relations for each of the voters independently. Okay, and once you have this distribution, you can talk about the probability of certain events. So, for instance, the probability that there exists a Condorcet winner. This is something that we have studied a couple of lectures ago, and I showed you a table of this. And here we are interested in the probability that a scoring rule picks a Condorcet winner whenever one exists. And it turns out if you just compare scoring rules to each other, so you compare Borders rule to plurality, to anti-plurality, and to all other scoring rules that exist, then among this class of rules, Borders rule most likely picks the Condorcet winner. Okay, so all, all, all other scoring rules pick the Condorcet winner less frequently than Borders rule does. Okay. Yes, yeah, so sometimes the proofs that I'm not showing you are the interesting ones because, well, they are, I'm not sure about this one. So maybe, I think this one is probably not that difficult as you may imagine at this point. Um, but also, in particular in today's lecture, I have to omit a couple of proofs because uh, some of them are quite tedious and, and long. You're welcome. Any other questions at this point? Okay. So then let's talk about how you could unify the ideas of Border and Condorcet, because as I said, that would be the, the theme of today's lecture. So somehow try to devise a social choice function um, that um, has both the flavor um, of what bon uh, Border proposed and what Condorcet proposed. And here are two proposals, which I think both of these are not completely convincing, but I'm just giving you them as, an, as a rough idea of what you could think about. Um, the first one is um, called Black's Rule. It was proposed by a very early social choice theorist called Duncan Black. And here, his idea to unify the ideas of Border and Condorcet is just as follows. Whenever there is a Condorcet winner, you return the Condorcet winner. In all other cases, you return the Border winner or the Border winners. There could be several of these. Okay, so this function is a Condorcet extension, right? Because whenever there is a Condorcet winner, it will be selected. Um, but so since many of you are smiling already, I, I, I guess it, I don't need to convince you that this is really just a very mm, like rough ad hoc combination of these two ideas and probably not what, you, what we would want to have in mind if you want to find a social choice function that, that satisfies the ideals of both of these functions. Um, in particular, for instance, um, Black's rule does not satisfy reinforcement, right? so, and if, which we have learned last time is the defining property of scoring rules. Um, okay, so, and then the other idea that uh, you, you can uh, see as a unification of, of Border and Condorcet is Baldwin's rule, which you know about already, so it was on the last exercise sheet, and I think also on an earlier exercise sheet. So it's a runoff method where in each round you delete the alternative with the lowest border score until no more such alternatives can be deleted. And then the last remaining alternative, or it could be more than one again, is, uh, is the Baldwin winner. 
And here, and I think that was also an exercise, um, um, it's probably a bit surprising if we hear about this in the first place that this is a Condorcet extension. Okay, so because now we know, uh, you didn't know this last week, but now we know that border itself is not a Condorcet extension. Okay, so border, borders rule fails to select a Condorcet winner. But if we keep deleting the alternative with the lowest border score, then this is a Condorcet extension. And um, it's now pretty obvious because I mentioned on the previous slide that the alternative with the lowest border score is never the Condorcet winner. Okay, so that's the heart of the proof of the statement. Um, so if we delete alternatives which are never a Condorcet winner, um, then if there is a Condorcet winner, we will eventually just have the Condorcet winner remaining in the end. So this seems a bit nicer, I guess, than, than Black's rule. Um, so it is a Condorcet extension and it is based on border scores and therefore it, it also has the ideas of border. Um, unfortunately, as uh, we know from the, I guess that's even the first exercise sheet, Baldwin's rule fails to be monotonic, which is not so good. Right? So monotonicity was one of those properties where we said that really any reasonable social choice function should satisfy it. Um, and, and this is actually true for, for, for basically every runoff rule. Um, and monotonic a failure of monotonicity means that you can make an alternative stronger and then it suddenly is dropped out of the choice set. Okay, so these are these two ad hoc ideas to, to unify the ideas of border and Condorcet. Um, and um, now we will look in a, at a more deeper level and uh, at how we can perhaps uh, get something that has the flavor of both border and Condorcet. And at first we will see a rather negative result and that's the, the main proof of the first part of the lecture. Maybe it's even the main proof of today's lecture, I, I, I think. And uh, this is the following statement. Um, the th statement was shown by Young and Levenglick, and what they have shown is that no Condorcet extension satisfies reinforcement whenever there are at least three alternatives. Okay, and, and here the idea is that, okay, first we showed that Borders rule is no Condorcet extension. Then we showed that every scoring rule fails to be a Condorcet extension. And now we are taking even a step further back and say, okay, so maybe let's just insist on reinforcement because that's certainly a nice property as, as we have seen last time and it's the defining property of scoring rules. Um, but this statement shows that no Condorcet extension and as, as we have seen last week, so the class of Condorcet extensions is very rich. So there are many things you can do in the absence. You can basically do anything in the absence of a Condorcet winner. So th this includes C1, C2, C3 functions, but no Condorcet extension satisfies reinforcement whenever we have at least three alternatives. Um, given that we have seen this characterization of scoring rules using reinforcement, this statement is not completely surprising at this point, right? Because if, for instance, here, let's say, if we, for this class, the social choice functions satisfying reinforcement, if we also add anonymity and neutrality to that, what would this circle correspond to then? What would this class be? If we say the social choice functions that satisfy reinforcement, anonymity and neutrality, Yes? Two arrows in possibility? No, no. <laughs> um, yes? Uh, exactly. Um, or composed scoring rules, yes. So this, this is exactly the class of scoring rules um, that we talked about last week. So composed scoring rules are completely characterized by anonymity, neutrality, and reinforcement. Okay, so, so the extra benefit we get from, from this statement here is that it doesn't need anonymity or neutrality. So even if we don't, it's, so you, you, you can define functions that satisfy reinforcement that are different from composed scoring rules, which violate anonymity and neutrality. Um, okay, and this, the proof of this statement I'm, I'm going to show you. And one nice thing about this proof is, is that it's um, simpler than the original proof of the statement. Um, and it was actually found by a student of this course many years ago. He was called Kevin Cardell, and he found a, a simplified proof of the statement. And interestingly, this proof also uses less voters than the original statement by Young and Levenglick. So in, in, in their theorem, they used 13 voters. The proof that I'm going to show you, which is really quite simple, only uses nine voters. <coughs> 
And quite recently, so a couple of months ago, I was in contact with Peyton Young, who's one of the authors of that paper, and uh, it turns out that he didn't even know about the simplified proof, and he was still interested in whether there are proofs that use less number of voters. So, so usually, if you optimize the number of voters, it's not such a big deal, because in many cases, the original authors of these proofs were not really thinking about the smallest possible proof, but in this case, he was interested in that, and so I could tell him about the uh, student, student's proof um, of this simple statement, which was nice. Okay, so... The proof I'm going to show you over here. Um, now, recall what the statement that we want to show is that reinforcement and Condorcet consistency are incompatible with each other. Okay, so th these are the only two axioms that we have. So we don't have anonymity, neutrality, Pareto optimality, or anything like that. We only have these two properties. And in order to show this, we first start with a preference profile, <laughs> which looks a bit familiar. We change the numbers on top a little bit. Okay, so it's just like the classic Condorcet paradox, but we have two voters of each kind. So there's a total of six voters. Um, oh, oh, okay, I didn't do it right. Uh, so that should be A here, right? Okay, A, B, C, B, C, A, C, A, B. Okay, and now for this preference profile, I'm sure you all know what the majority graph looks like, because that is a Condorcet cycle, and the fact that we doubled each column of voters doesn't really change the fact that this is a three cycle. It's only that the weight on each of these edges um, has changed. So the weight on these edges, and we will see this in more detail later on in today's lecture, th the weights that I'm drawing here, um, I think you probably have seen this in exercises already, is just the number of voters, uh, for instance, for the first Right here, it's the number of voters who prefer uh, A to B minus the number of voters who prefer B to A. So the, the margin between these two numbers is exactly two. Um, okay, so um, okay, so now we have a social choice function that is supposed to select from. Maybe let's give this a name and the name to this preference profile. So this preference profile is preference profile R. So we have a social choice function which satisfies reinforcement and Condorcet consistency. And this social choice function has to select from this preference profile. It has to select something. Now it turns out there's no Condorcet winner in this profile, reinforcement by itself. So it's, in, it's a so-called um, inter-profile condition. So we, you need to combine profiles in order to get any meaningful consequences. So for this profile alone, we don't learn anything uh, from, from these two axioms that we have. Um, any of the three alternatives could be selected, but at least one needs to be selected. Um, and since this profile is completely symmetric, and this is what makes the proof relatively simple, we can assume without loss of generality that alternative A is among the winners. Okay, and I, I hope you can imagine at this point already that you can also break it down into three different cases. If alternative B is selected here, we, we can continue the proof slightly differently and use exactly the same arguments, okay, because the profile is completely symmetric. So here we assume, without loss of generality, WLOG, that alternative A is returned by this social choice function, which we know satisfies Condorcet consistency and reinforcement. Okay, so far so good. Um, and now, in order to use reinforcement, we need at least one other preference profile, because then we need to combine these preference profiles in order to get the consequence of reinforcement. And for this, we define a second preference profile, which has only three voters. The first one has preference relation ACB. Would you mind? <laughs> okay, thanks. And the last voter has the preference relation CAB. Okay, so it's three voters. Um, clearly, here the majority relation is not cyclic. Okay, so I hope, I hope this is obvious to, to everybody, because a majority have the same preference relation, and um, then the majority graph looks like this. Um, so the majority graph basically corresponds exactly to the preference relation of those two voters here, because they form a majority. Okay, so the majority of the voters have exactly the same preferences, and that means all uh, so the majority prefers A to B, A to C, and also C to B. And now here you can again add these weights, which is just the margins um, between these numbers of voters. 
Okay, so that's a simple preference profile. Um, and again, let's, uh, let us remind which two properties we have. We have reinforcement and we have Condorcet consistency. Okay, Condorcet consistency we can use for this profile because there is a Condorcet winner, right? Alternative A is a Condorcet winner. Therefore, we know for a fact that this function needs to select A uniquely even because it is the Condorcet winner. Okay, um, maybe let's just write down Condorcet here so that you know where this comes from. Okay, and uh, now everything that is remaining at this point is, is that we have a preference profile where A is among the winners, we have a preference profile where A is even uniquely selected, and now reinforcement means if we, if we merge these two preference profiles, this one has six voters, this one has three voters, we get a profile with nine voters, um, and then the consequence is that alternative A still needs to be selected uniquely even if you have reinforcement, right? Because A is the only alternative that lies at the intersection of these two choice sets. We don't know which other alternatives are selected here. It doesn't matter because the intersection of this set and this set here will always be uniquely A. And well, if you're following closely, you will probably be not completely surprised to see that these profiles have been carefully selected to make sure that in the in the, like in the union of these two profiles, we get a different Condorcet winner, because that's really the only possibility we have to rule out an alternative. And that's possible if we have a different Condorcet winner here. So here, this is where we use reinforcement. Um, and then clearly, so reinforcement implies that for this new profile consisting of nine voters, a needs to be selected uniquely. Okay, now let's look at the majority graph of this unified profile. So I'm not even, so here, here I could uh, like write down the preference profile using nine voters, but I'm not really interested in that. The only thing I need is the majority graph um, that we get if we add these two things. And this we can conveniently get by just basically just adding these graphs, graphs on top of each other. Right? So for instance, let's look at the relationship between A and B here. So here the majority margin was two from A to B, and here it is three from A to B. And that means that in, these, in this merged preference profile, we have a majority edge from A to B and the weight will be five. So in the end, the weights are not important. I'm just, because for, for, Condors, for whether there is a Condorcet winner or not, the weights are not necessary. I'm just drawing down the weights so that you know um, what, what happens to these majority graphs. Now, here we have a majority edge going in this direction here um, with weight two. And here we have an, an edge going in the other direction with, which has only weight one. So these basically then are added on top of each other. Um, and that means since the first edge has more weight than the second one and the, the difference of weights is exactly one, that this is a majority edge from C to A which only has weight one, right? And the same thing happens if we add, we ha here we have like a light edge going from B to C and a more heavier edge going from C to B. So if we add both of these on top of, top of each other, we will have a majority edge from C to B and the weight will be again one because the difference of these two weights is one. And that basically already concludes the proof because now in this new preference profile, maybe let's write down what this is here. So this is R union, R prime. Okay, so these are two disjoint sets of voters and then we are just taking the merger of these two preference profiles. In this new preference profile, we have a Condorcet winner, namely alternative C. So in this new profile, alternative C needs to be selected uniquely. Okay, and clearly this is in conflict to what we have gotten from reinforcement because reinforcement told us that A has to be the unique winner. And that, that completes the entire proof. I think it's really nice and short. Um, okay, so what, what this statement gives you is that um, 
every Condor Sail extension, no matter which one you think of, so it could be Young's Rule or Maximin, or so there are so many other Condor Sail extensions that we are going to define throughout this course, all of these will violate reinforcement. Because all of these Condor Sail extensions in this profile will select A, because they are a Condor Sail extension, in this profile they will select C, and in this profile, they have to select something, right? And this is basically where the proof started. So here we assumed without loss of generality that A is being selected. Then we constructed these two, uh, or this other preference profile, depending on the selection of A. If B or C were selected here, of course, then we can construct similar profiles like the R prime profile and get the same conclusion. So Condorcy consistency is, is incompatible with, with reinforcement. Um, and um, so this kind of construction is seen as uh, by, by many people. So as I said, even in today's uh, contemporary social choice theory, there are people who follow uh, more what Border proposed and, and other people who like uh, the idea of Condorcet extensions better. Um, and this, this kind of construction is usually used as an argument against Condorcet extensions because it seems like it's a pretty severe violation of reinforcement because here we have Condorcet winner A. So if you start with this profile here, and then we add a, uh, a preference profile, which is completely symmetric. Okay, so all three alternatives are exactly the same. Um, um, and just by adding this, this symmetric profile, the Condorcet winner changes from alternative A to alternative C. Okay, so this is what, what many people, so there are, there's, for instance, a social choice theorist called Donald Zari. So this is uh, an argument that he repeatedly uses to argue against Condorcet extensions because um, what these people say is that this preference profile doesn't contain any information. It's completely symmetric. And by adding this, you change the Condorcet winner from one alternative to the other. Um, so one thing you could respond to these people is, is that the assumption that this preference profile does not contain any information is maybe not really correct because, well, it is completely symmetric. All alternatives are essentially the same in this preference profile, but this cycle has a direction. Right? It's, it's going um, clockwise. So there's also a cycle that goes the other way on, which goes counterclockwise. So it's not really completely symmetric, this profile, because it really depends on the fact that this cycle is going clockwise such that this construction works. Um, so, for instance, if you add a preference profile where there are majority ties between all the alternatives, um, of course, you can add uh, those profiles as many as you want uh, using reinforcement, and the Condorcet winner will still remain the same. Um, nevertheless, let me note here so that this thing here is usually a criticism of Condorcet extensions. which I think is, is quite obvious why it's a criticism, because last time we, uh, we agreed that reinforcement is a nice property. Well, it's incompatible with Condorcet extensions. Yes? Um, so if we were to ensure that in this kind of profile there is no Condorcet cycle? Or? Yes, we do need the, so Yes, because if, if you add two profiles, both of which have a Condorcet winner, so then, of course, uh, in, the, in the resulting profile, it will still be the same Condorcet winner. Yes. 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 So, or in other words, if you look at the domain, so because uh, in, in this uh, iteration of this course, we have this, uh, like I, I recently added all these domain assumptions to make the statements more precise. If you look at the domain where majority relation is transitive, so I think we called it D-trans, so in, within this domain, um, there is only one Condorcet extension. So they all coincide because there will always be a Condorcet winner. And the function that selects the Condorcet winner satisfies reinforcement within this domain. So if, if you only look at preference profiles that have Condorcet winners, we can use reinforcement and everything is fine. That's a good point. But of course, so if, if, if there always were Condorcet winners, social choice would be so easy anyway. <laughs> so it's really these kinds of profiles that get us into trouble. Okay, um, right, so one, one other thing that I would like to show you, since we now criticize Condorcet extensions, and then maybe you, you, you might come to the conclusion, okay, so maybe, maybe Border uh, was right, and the ideas by Condorcet are all flawed, and we should all use Border's rule instead. So there are different types of criticisms for, for, border, for Border's rule. Um, let me show you one here. <coughs> 
So usually these kind of, of, of criticisms really are, are based on one particular integrate, uh, intricate preference profile which shows that, that a rule does something quite uh, yeah, um, undesirable. <laughs> So here, let's look at the preference profile where we have 100 rotors. Okay, 99 of those rotors have the same preferences, and one rotor has, uh, has a different preference relation. And the idea how we want to criticize border here is that um, the border score really depends on how many alternatives are ranked in between two alternatives. Okay, so the difference in border scores. If we compare two alternatives A and B, so the difference in border scores will be exactly how many number, how, what, how many alternatives are ranked in between those two alternatives. And therefore, you can take this to the extreme and have a preference profile where 99 of these voters prefer A to B. And then you have, maybe let's look, take a different color here. You have clones of the very same alternative, C. Uh, so C1 to CK. All these uh, voters rank the alternative exactly the same. And then this remaining voter prefers B the most. Then again, we have all these clones. So they all agree, so all 100 voters agree on the relative ranking of these clones. And then this last voter prefers alternative A the least. Okay, so let's, for a concrete example, let's take K to be 100. And well, then this, first this preference profile, it may look very contrived, but it's not completely unrealistic because, so these outcomes could be anything, so for instance, these different variants of outcome C could be that the voters get, uh, say, I don't know, 100 euros, 99 euros, 98 euros, and then you would assume that all the voters have the same preferences over these different outcomes. Okay, everybody prefers 100 euros more than 99 euros, then more than 98 euros, and so on, and, and that's why they have the same preferences here. Um, and then alternatives A could be something completely different, which uh, is not attached to any monetary value. And then it turns out that the score of alternative A is um, 99 times 101, okay, because the total number of alternatives is 102. And this is actually less than the border score of alternative B, because the border score of alternative B is 99 times 100, okay, that's for the first column, plus 101. Okay, it's, it's, it's close, but alternative B has a higher score. And that means what uh, Borders rule will do for this particular preference profile is to select alternative B. Okay, and if you only look at these alternatives here, A, B, and C, so maybe let's highlight this alternative B is selected by Borders rule. So Borders will, will select an alternative even though 99 out of 100 voters think that alternative A is better. <laughs> okay, so this example also shows um, that it's, it's another example showing that Borders rule is no Condorcet extension because clearly in this example there's a Condorcet winner. Okay, alternative A is the Condorcet winner. 99 out of 100 voters think A is the best alternative. Um, and that's why this kind of example is often used as a criticism of Borders rule because you can make this, this, uh, these numbers as large as you would like them to be. So it's, you can say that everybody but a single voter thinks that A, alternative A is better than B. Nevertheless, alternative B will be selected by Borders rule as long as you have sufficiently many alternatives. Okay, so if you have only a small number of alternatives, you cannot really construct a drastic example like this one here. So the main reason why I'm showing you this to some extent is that um, well, it, it, it shows why there are these, these different views about social choice. So in, in, it, it also turns out that it depends really on the application, which kind of, of social choice function is more appropriate. It's, there's no clear-cut case where you can say that, um, for instance, Condorcet extensions are better than, than scoring rules, or scoring rules are better than Condorcet extensions in general. So there are arguments against um, and for each of these two approaches. Okay. All right, um, okay, so and the, the proof of the statement is what I have just shown you um, on in this, in this other app. So Condorcet extensions um, always have to violate reinforcement. So, so I said we, we set out to, to find something which unifies the idea of border and Condorcet, and now this seems like very bad news. Yes? 
Uh, yes. Yes, that's a good point, yeah, okay. So because for uh, last week we saw a statement where the, the number of potential voters needs to be the, uh, the set of natural numbers, so we have to potentially have an infinite number of voters. But as you have seen in the proof that I just showed you, nine voters suffice, okay. And this is, by the way, in, in case you're interested in open problems, so we now believe that nine is probably, so this proof that I showed you uses nine voters, so we had six voters in one profile, three voters in the other profile, and then if we merge those, we have a total of nine. Um, and we believe that the statement is, uh, does not hold for, for any lower number of voters, so it doesn't hold for eight voters, but we don't know for sure. <laughs> so so that's, that's an open problem. As, as, as I told you, the original proof by Levin, Lick, and Young used 13 voters, now we brought this a bit down to nine. Um, yeah, to some extent, these things are interesting to look at these boundaries where something is exactly happening, but if you spend some time on it, it can also be a bit boring and, and technical because the most important message is just that there is this incompatibility. It doesn't really matter much whether it, whether it happens at 9, 10, or 11 voters. Um, okay, so as I said, that's bad news, um, but in today's lecture, we will have uh, more positive news. And that will be a characterization of a so-called social preference function, which precisely unifies the ideas of, of Border and Condorcet. Um, so I haven't told you what a social preference function is. We are going to do this in a minute. Um, so social preference functions are different from social choice functions, and they're also different from social welfare functions. What they do is they take a preference profile and they return a set of preference relations. So in most cases, this will be a single preference relation, and then it will be just like a social welfare function. But in some cases, there can be ties. And in particular, we demand that in the output, all the preference relations have to be strict, which we didn't demand for social welfare functions. So it's like a set-valued social welfare function, but the collective preference relations all have to be strict. Okay, but we are going to, to define this formally, of course. But when you define functions like this, you can ag again define reinforcement by just saying that if two functions give you the same output for two electorates, and that's really the nice thing about reinforcement. So I think reinforcement is such a, a useful idea that has been used so many times uh, after it has been proposed by Young, um, because it can be defined for any kind of function. The output of the function is completely left open. We just say if the output for two, di two different electorates is the same, um, or if it intersects, then um, for the union of these two electorates, the output should be precisely the intersection. But what these things are is completely left open. So for instance, in some of our own research, we looked at functions that return lotteries over the alternatives, and then reinforcement is just defined as it was defined by Young. So if the output of the functions are the same, then the same should be true for the union. Um, okay, and if we, so reinforcement is just defined as we would expect it as defined, and then Condorcet consistency here, admittedly, so, so Young, who proved this characterization um, that I'm going to show you, used a relatively stringent interpretation of, of the Condorcet principle that I'm going to show you, but um, using this uh, axiom uh, called Condorcet consistency for these social preference functions, he was able to show that there's exactly one rule which lies at the intersection of these two sets. So there's exactly one rule which is Condorcet consistent and satisfies reinforcement for this slightly different model of social preference functions. And that's where we are heading at uh, in, today, in the rest of today's lecture. And this function is called Kemeny's rule. Okay. Um, Maybe, yeah, so I think maybe today it makes sense to make the break a little bit earlier. Um, so and then I have n more time afterwards. So maybe let's have a break now and then, uh, I don't know. Okay, let's continue. So by now I think you had enough time to read this quote here, which I think greatly describes of what we are going to do in the second half of the lecture. Um, we are using the statistical method of maximum likelihood estimation in order to define social choice functions. And this quote is from uh, E.B. White, who is an American writer. And um, this is an article from The New Yorker, and uh, White also co-authored Elements of Style, which is a, is a great book that teaches you how to write good in English. Um, and what the quote says is, is, democracy is the recurrent suspicion that more than half the people are right more than half the time. Okay, and, and this, I think, nicely describes the underlying model um, that was used by Condorcet um, to define social choice functions based on maximum likelihood estimation. So let me define this model. So 
the underlying assumption, I think it's, it's somewhat amusing because this is really typical of the time of enlightenment, which I briefly discussed last week, so where they really try to do everything right in total and absolute measures, like defining the standard meter, for instance, which I mentioned last week. So here in this model, the assumption is, is that there is an underlying correct preference ranking of the alternatives. Okay, so in, in, in some cases there might be something like this, um, in, in some other cases this may be a bit of a dubious assumption, but the assumption here is that there is a true ranking over the alternatives. And then when, um, when voters, um, so this should say when, when voters form their opinion, um, when voters form their opinion, then each voter selects a true pairwise comparison with some probability P. Okay, so with some probability P, um, the, it, it doesn't, no. Ah, okay, so this, sense, this sentence doesn't really make much sense. So when, okay, let me just quickly change this. So I, this should be right. <laughs> um, oh, I actually, oh no, oh, I cannot use a keyboard because this is my keyboard. Now this is a Bluetooth keyboard, that's how this thing works. Um, okay, forget about it. Um, <laughs> actually, now, now I see that maybe true pairwise comparison makes sense here. Okay, so what the underlying assumption is, is that each voter um, selects a pairwise comparison and with some probability P, they will choose the true pairwise comparison, which is the actual ranking of the alternatives. And with the remaining probability, it will use the other pairwise comparison. Okay, so there's some probability P, which is between one half and one. So it's strictly in between one half and one because the assumption is that voters are more likely to be correct uh, than incorrect. Okay, so if this probability would be one, then um, there would be this ground truth, as it's sometimes said, so a true preference relation, and everybody would have exactly the same preference relation because with probability one, they will select all their pairwise comparisons just as, this, um, as the true ranking of the alternatives is. But with some probability, the voters are incorrect. So they are, in some sense, they are estimating the absolute truth. Um, and the assumption is, is that they are right more often than they are wrong. So P has to be strictly larger than one half. So this is an important thing to keep in mind because as you can imagine, if they are more often wrong than they are right, well, then things really, really are bad. Um, okay, so when a voter forms their opinion, then, then they select a true pairwise comparison with this probability P and with, with one minus P, they are selecting the other pairwise comparison. Um, so, in some sense, the, the voters' preferences in this model are estimates of the truth. Okay? And one thing how this can be justified um, is, for instance, that's why I have this picture on the right-hand side, is that uh, there's, for instance, a jury, um, that those would be the voters, and then there's an absolute truth in the sense that, say, we have only two alternatives, m equals two, so um, suspect is guilty or is not guilty and there's an absolute truth, so e either he's guilty or he's not guilty, and then the different members of the jury, the voters in, in that case, would have different estimates of this absolute truth. And the, the optimistic assumption is, is that these members of the jury are more often right than they are wrong. <laughs> um, and once you have a model like this, you can define uh, so-called maximum likelihood functions. Okay, but this, this is what the underlying model is. So the, the preference relations are sampled from a so-called ground truth, with it, which is the true preference relation. Okay, so this is the example I just explained. And um, what Condorcet then did, he proved the so-called Condorcet jury theorem, which is, uh, I think, apart from the, the notion of Condorcet consistency, the other, or one other well-known result from Condorcet in the literature. And uh, to, to make this statement, we need to define a so-called maximum likelihood social choice function. And the maximum likelihood social choice function for some given P, so P will be the same for all of these voters. We will have the same probability for all of these voters. It will be just some number between one half and one. And the maximum likelihood social choice function yields all alternatives that are most likely to be top ranked in the true ranking. Okay, um, so we have a preference profile. And we know that this preference profile has been sampled from this ground truth according to this probabilistic assumption. And then we want to say um, what would be uh, the correct choice, which, which choice is most likely the correct one given this sampled preference profile that we are looking at. And then what uh, Condorcet proved is that um, if we have only two alternatives, so if m equals two, then majority rule does exactly this. So majority rule is the maximum likelihood social choice function if we have two alternatives. 
And uh, the way we, you can prove this is, is that for each profile R, you can compute how likely it is that this profile was sampled according to the ground truth, and then you can compare. So let's say the ground truth was A is better than B. So um, we only assume strict preferences here for simplicity. And then you can compare this to the probability that the ground truth was uh, that B is better than A. And it turns out that for majority rule, the first number is always larger than the second number. Um, so if you are interested in this, I can also upload a proof of the statement to Moodle. So it's, it's not extremely difficult um, for this for this two alternative case. And it gives a nice justification for majority rule. Also, if you think about this jury application, so th that's why it's called the jury theorem. So um, it's supposed to give a probabilistic justification for making majority decisions in a jury. So because some of these members of the jury may be incorrect, uh, but they are more likely to be correct than incorrect. And then in this formal model, this gives a justification for making a majority decision within this jury. And on top of that, it turns out that, which is also not completely surprising, is the more voters there are, the more likely is majority rule to be correct. So I will always have correct and truth and everything like this in quotation marks. In the jury example, it makes a lot of sense, but surely if you think about political elections, for instance, probably there's not really something like an, an absolute ranking of, of the parties. <laughs> um, okay, so but the more voters there are, the, the better uh, majority rule uh, becomes in the sense that it's more likely to make the correct choice. And when the number of voters goes to infinity, then the majority rule converges to the absolute truth uh, with probability one. So this is just a, like a probabilistic interpretation of, of this statement by Condorcet. So for two alternatives, again, as in, in previous cases, things are quite nice and well behaved and majority rule does the job. Um, now, if we extend this to uh, more than two alternatives, it turns out that uh, the answer to the question, what is the maximum likelihood social choice function, really depends on this probability p. So it, it can be shown that if p is sufficiently close to one half, it still needs to be greater than one half, that, that's for sure. But if it's sufficiently close to one half, then Borders rule is the maximum likelihood social choice function. Um, so just so the, the proof of this is quite technical. Um, that's uh, also why, why I'm not showing it. So I, I think in previous years I was sometimes uh, showing a proof of this statement, which was a bit simplified, but in, in the end it turned out it was so simplified that the proof argument was incorrect, so <laughs> that's why I'm not doing this anymore. But the statement is true. Um, and uh, so the idea is that uh, border winners are, in some sense, winners that receive most pairwise votes, right? Because uh, if you give uh, a border score, let's say, of uh, three to, if one voter gives a border score of three, um, that means that there are um, like three alternatives. Uh, no, uh, three alternatives that are ranked below uh, this alternative. Um, so, and because of the equidistance nature of these border scores, um, so you can think of these as pairwise votes. And this is like a, a very rough ex explanation of um, of why if p is sufficiently close to one half, you get borders rule in the end. So, if, if for other parameters of p, it really depends. Um, so I think if, if p is close to 1, it's not even exactly clear what this rule would be. So I think it would select Condorcy winners whenever there is a Condorcy winner. So, so what Young does in this paper, he uses a specific preference profile and argues that in this preference profile, um, I think the maximin winner would be the maximum likelihood outcome, but this is only for one specific profile. And in some parts of the later literature, this was misinterpreted by saying that in general, maximin is the maximum likelihood social choice function. Um, so I think um, if, if the probability is large, then this is an indicator that we should take a Condorcet extension, but uh, which function this is exactly is not clear at this point. Um, all right. Um, now this was really just like an introduction to get you used to the idea of maximum likelihood estimation, because this is one way of how we can define Kamini's rule. So there are many ways, so like with all nice rules, there are many, many different ways of, of uh, like proposing them. And uh, one way for doing this for Kamini's rule is maximum likelihood estimation. Yes. Okay, that's that's a great question. So is <laughs> um, maybe I should have mentioned this because so the question was is that if you're sampling from this ground truth, if you have only two alternatives, everything is fine. But if you have more than two alternatives and you are sampling with the same probability p for every pair of alternatives, of course you can also get intransitive preference relations for the voters. 
right? So because there's uh, if there's always the probability of, of having a cycle in an individual preference relation, and um, as as far as I recall, this is actually what Young is doing. So in, in this paper, I think that was also one of the reasons why this proof that I mentioned earlier. Um, didn't, didn't really fit in the model that we are having here, because here we assume that all individual preferences have to be transitive. Um, um, but in, in general, if you use the sampling model, I think the way Young used it, this also allows for intransitive individual preference relations. Okay. But that's a very good point. Um, Okay, so now Kemeny's rule, so which is also known as the Kemeny-Young rule. So there's uh, yeah, lots of results by Young in today's lecture and also the last lecture. Um, it's, it's known under the name Kemeny-Young method because Young gave uh, like two different characterizations of Kemeny's rule that we are going to see today. And uh, Kemeny was a famous mathematician and also a computer scientist. So for example, has anybody ever heard about Kemeny before? Okay, so it's, it looked like somebody has. So, um, so Kemeny, for instance, invented a programming language called BASIC, um, which maybe most of you have never heard about, but I'm pretty old since it was the first programming language that I heard about when I was a kid, because at that time it was like the beginner's programming language. Um, so it's interesting, I'm just mentioning this fact because like, it's, it, he's a ma mathematician who also worked in computer science, and then he proposed a function which belongs to the area of social choice theory. Um, Okay, and as I mentioned, now for, for Kemeny's rule, we need to switch models to this model, or not, we're not switching models, we are switching the class of functions that we are looking at from social choice functions to so-called social preference functions. So a social preference function, uh, which is abbreviated as SPF, is a function that maps from the domain of preference profiles, so in our case it will be just strict preference relations, so D of U will be defined just as we did last week. So we will have a variable electorate, but all the, all the voters will have strict preferences. And then it maps to um, a set of strict rankings. Okay, so F, so this calligraphic F was uh, the, um, um, the set of, um, of non-empty and finite subsets of some function. Okay, and L of U was just the set of linear rankings or strict preference relations. Okay, in this case, uh, as we are studying it right now, so the domain also has strict preferences for the voters. So what this function is doing, you have a preference profile with strict preferences for the voters, and then you map to a set of strict preference rankings for the society. And I think I mentioned it before already, so ideally that should only be a single ranking, but since we don't have ties in the collective preference relation, in some few cases there will be several collective preference relations. Okay, so it's, it's really like a set-valued social welfare function, um, with the slight difference that all these rankings have to be strict. Okay, and the results that I'm going to show you really precisely need this requirement, so there was no way of really getting this into the model of social welfare functions. Um, also note at this point, so for the mathematically inclined among you, so if, if we assume anonymity, then the different uh, identities of the voters don't matter, so then we are essentially mapping from a set of preference relations to a set of preference relations, so it's an endomorphism then, this function. Um, but ideally, of course, it should map to a very small set of preference relations in the end, so in most cases there will be a unique um, social preference relation returned by a social preference function. Okay, and now we want to apply this idea of maximum likelihood estimation to social preference functions, which is pretty straightforward because well, we have in this model we have this absolute ground truth, which, which is a correct ranking of the alternatives, and the maximum likelihood social preference function for some probability p, again p is between, it's strictly greater than one half and strictly less than one, um, um, and for any such p, uh, maximum likelihood SPF returns those rankings that are most likely correct. Okay. So a social preference function is supposed to select those rankings. So we, we have a preference profile, which was sampled according to this ground truth assumption. Um, so we are sampling pairwise, co pairwise comparisons um, with this probability p. And then given this preference profile, we want to return those rankings which are most likely the ground truth, given that we have the single sampled preference profile. Okay, and uh, yeah, what's, it, what's a bit funny is that I'm introducing this, this entire notion of a social preference function, but we will only talk about one social preference function, which is Kemeny's rule. Um, and Kemeny's rule is defined as follows. Um, so first observe that this is, it's a nice, short and compact definition, um, 
And again, it follows this theme that I already highlighted last time. So many social choice functions are maximizing something. Okay, so we had this slide that I started uh, with today, where we showed that, uh, where we had that Copeland's rule is maximizing the Copeland's power, Borders rule is of course maximizing the border score, Maximin is also ma maximizing some score. Um, ya even Young's rule can be seen as maximizing something. And the same is true for Kamini's rule. Um, now let's let's see what this thing actually does. Um, okay, so it looks, oops, it looks at those preference relations such that if we take the intersection of this collective preference relation and the preference relation of one of the voters, so here we are summing up over all the different voters in the preference profile, we take the intersection of these two relations and then we count how many elements are in there. <laughs> And the sum of these should be maximal. Okay, and then, then this returns the argument, so that means what the function eventually returns are preference relations. Okay, so they are collective preference relations. Elements of the set L of U are returned by this function. So what, what is happening here? Okay, so this, it, 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 for, to some of you this may even seem incorrect because we have two relations and we take the intersection of these two relations, but again, the mathematically inclined will know that a relation is just a set, just like a function is only a set, so a relation is only a set of pairs. Okay, and then therefore we can take the intersection of two relations. Okay, um, and I think I've prepared something which makes this quite clear, hopefully. So. So let's take these two relations here. So this is the first relation, ABC, and the second relation is CAB. And as I said, a relation is nothing but uh, a set of pairs. And for instance, if we break down this preference relation here as a set, it will have the following elements. The ordered pair AB, because, well, A is preferred to B, the ordered pair BC and AC. Well, and then this relation here is also reflexive. It's the weak preference relation. So we have these pairs A, A, B, B, C, C. Okay, so there's a total of six elements in this set here. Okay, now we have this other preference relation, where C is preferred to A and A is preferred to B. Um, here the elements are C, A, because C is preferred to A, A, B, and then C, B, because C is also preferred to B. And then, of course, for all of these weak preference relations, we will always have these reflexive pairs. They are not really that interesting but they are part of this set here. Um, if you would only look at the strict part of this preference relation, then we could drop these later, th later three. Th this is precisely the difference, since we are assuming that preferences are strict, this is precisely the difference between this set and the strict version um, of it. Okay, now what we are doing is we are looking at the, uh, like the intersection of these two sets, so that's why I drew a Venn diagram here. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have the first preference relation. On the right-hand side, we have the second preference relation. And now, if you, it's really just the intersection as you know it. So, for instance, the pair AC is only contained in the first set, but it's not contained in the second set, well, of course, because these two persons, uh, if you want to think of them as persons, disagree about the relative ranking of A and C. So the first one prefers A to C, but the second one doesn't. Same is true for BC. Okay, so we have AC here, CA here, BC here, and CB here. These two guys, uh, agree on the relative ranking of A and B. That's why this, why this uh, pair AB is at the intersection of these two sets. Um, well, and then always, so that's, I think it's, supposed, yeah, it's, it's light gray here, so th th we have these uninteresting reflexive pairs which are co always contained at the intersection. And the single outlier here we have as well. Um, so this pair BA, um, well, it also belongs to this diagram here because it's not contained in any of these two sets, so nobody thinks that B is better than A. Okay, and um, I think you can hopefully get the idea of what we are doing here is if we are taking um, the intersection of, of two sets that represent preference relations, we are counting the pairwise agreements between these two relations. Okay, so in this example, um, the rankings are almost opposed. If you want, well, it's only three alternatives, so maybe that's a bit exaggerated, but the, the only pairwise agreement here is uh, among A and B. So both of these voters agree that A and B um, have the same relative ranking, but otherwise they completely disagree about all the other alternatives, except for these reflexive things. Okay, um, okay and this really is what, what Kamini's rule does. So Kamini's rule, if you think back of the definition, I'm going to show it to you in a minute, is um, it, 
counts the number of pairwise agreements. So you want to find a preference ranking which agrees with the pairwise uh, preferences of the voters as much as possible. Okay, so you can take any ranking of the alternatives and then compute what could be called the Kemeny score, by just looking at each pairwise comparison and counting how many voters have exactly this pairwise comparison, then just adding everything up, and then return those rankings in the end which have maximal score. Okay, and um, yeah, sometimes we also need to talk about pairwise disagreement here, so the symmetric difference, so this triangle here is the symbol for symmetric dif difference, that would be the set consisting of those four uh, objects here, that is sometimes also called the Kendall Tau distance of two preference relations, or of two relations in general, it could be any relation. Has anybody ever heard about Kendall Tau distance? Or sometimes it's also just called Kendall distance? Okay, so but it's just, okay, great. <laughs> so it's um, just a natural notion of, uh, if you want to have a distance between two relations, it's natural to count pairwise disagreements, right? And that would be the symmetric difference. Okay, so I hope that this here is clear. Now let's get back to the definition of Kemeny's rule. Okay, so what we are doing here for Kemeny's rule, let's again look at the definition. We are, we are going over all the different voters in the preference profile. So this will change the preference relation here. And then just we count for each preference relation of the voters how many pairwise comparisons are identical in the voters preference relation and in this preference relation that we are looking at. So this way we can compute a score for each of these preference relations and then in the end return one that maximizes this, this score. So it seems like a natural function and that's, as we will see later in today's lecture, there are many other justifications for, for using Kemeny's rule, apart from maximum likelihood, as, as you will see uh, on the slide, which is one, one characterization of Kemeny's rule. But here again, there's just a verbal description of what the function does, so it leads all rankings that maximize pairwise agreement. Okay, so in other words, it returns rankings of the alternatives that agree with as many pairwise preferences of the voters as possible. And um, well, one of the re or the main reason, basically, why I introduced this maximum likelihood model here is that um, it can be shown that Kemeny's rule is the maximum likelihood social preference function for any p. Okay, by any p, of course, still we have the assumption that p is strictly greater than one half. So if, if, if voters are more often wrong than they are right, then of course everything falls apart. Um, or basically you get the opposite of this function, right? If you know for sure that everybody is, is, <laughs> is more often wrong than, than they are right. Um, yeah, what's, what's interesting is so I, I, here I'm, I'm giving two different authors here you, who surely didn't collaborate, um, so that was 200 years later. Um, and the funny thing is that, so, so Condorcet wrote this, this uh, pamphlet, or if you want to call it paper, about social choice theory, and um, first proposed the idea of Condorcet extensions, and then he used the, at the time, new theory of uh, probability calculus, um, in the form of maximum likelihood estimation in order to, to, to devise a social choice function. He didn't quite get it right for more than three alternatives, but for three alternatives he did, and then that's why, why Peyton Young, in one of his papers, he was really like deciphering the old writings of Condorcet, as you can imagine, so in the 18th century, these texts were written quite differently from what you are uh, expected to read today. Um, but so Young came to the conclusion, so what, what Condorcet actually had in mind when he gave a concrete function, not only the class of Condorcet extensions, but one concrete function that should be used, was really Kemeny's rule, much, much earlier than, than Kemeny himself. But so I, I don't think there's not even a year here. So I think Kemeny proposed Kemeny's rule in 1959. Um, still much, much later, of course, than Condorcet, <laughs> 20th century. Um, and yeah, so Young argued that um, even though Condorcet made some mistakes in his calculations, um, what he wanted to devise was really just Kemeny's rule. Um, okay, so let's see. So I think now it would be just nice to do an example um, to really see how this function is working. And the nice thing is, is this example is really from the 18th century. It's from Condorcet himself. <laughs> Maybe that also explains why it's not one of those minimal examples that we're usually looking at, but the example is not really showing anything. It's just an example for how you can um, compute the Kemeny ranking. Um, so I think it's just amazing to see that, like, like from, from today's standpoint, it's like 250 years ago, some people were thinking about exactly the same things that we are now, at this moment, also thinking about. Um, 
Okay, so this is a preference profile, and now we want to compute the uh, Kemeny score of this preference profile, or the Kemeny ranking. And, um, and as I said, so one way to think about this, and we will, in the rest of today's lecture, we will slowly develop methods which makes this uh, easier to work with, but the, the simplest way to um, if you have only the definition at hand in order to find uh, a Kemeny ranking is really just to enumerate all the possible rankings of, all of the alternatives and then compute the scores for each of these rankings by adding the pairwise agreements with the voters um, and then just see whichever ranking has the highest score. Okay? Just to make sure that you understand how the definition works, let's just do it for this uh, preference profile here. Okay, so First thing is, so if we have a ranking of three alternatives, A, B, and C, that means we have three pairwise comparisons. So A is better than B, B is better than C, and also A is better than C by transitivity. So we need to compare the agreements. We need to count how many voters prefer A to B at first. Okay, so that would be 23 and 10, and that's it, right? Okay, so for here, it's 23. It's really a pity that this pencil thing is so thick here, but it cannot be adjusted. So this is the agreement for the pair AB. Okay, and then we need to add further pairwise uh, agreements. So let's maybe next take BC. Maybe even, well, let's, let's use more colors here, BC. Um, okay, so how many voters prefer B to C? We have again those 23 here. We have 17, and we have these two here, right? Okay, so 23 plus 17 plus 2. And then finally, the third pairwise comparison is AC, 23. So, okay, so the reason that 23 keeps reappearing is, is no surprise because, well, this ranking is exactly ABC, right? So those, the this collective preference relation completely agrees with what these 23 voters have in mind. Um, okay, so it's 23 and two only, right? Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just lazy, so I, I rarely compute, so you can add up those numbers. <laughs> and then, oh, okay. Should have left some space there. <laughs> You get 100, it seems. Is that possible? Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So the score of this r collective ranking uh, ABC would be exactly 100. And I think you, are, you have now seen how this would work for the other rankings as well. And then you get different scores for these other um, rankings of the alternatives. And then it turns out, and this is why this is already highlighted in, in uh, red here, that the collective preference relation BCE has the highest amount of pairwise agreement with the voters' preferences as described here. Okay, because here, so now you have to trust me on these numbers, but if you have uh, a lot of time at home, you can of course recompute those numbers <laughs> and tell me if I did anything wrong, but I, I, I'm pretty sure they are right. Um, so the score, if you want, let's, we can call this the Kemeny score of BCA would be 104, and that means that um, BCA is the unique Kemeny ranking here. And I guess now you can already see, so I, I promised you that even though in principle these functions can return several rankings, that in most cases there will be just a single ranking, and now you can probably see that it's quite unlikely that in general that you have several rankings which give you exactly the same score. I'm going to show you an example later on, but um, so for natural examples, of course, there will always be a unique uh, ranking, Kemeny ranking of the alternatives. Um, so now we can observe what, what this actually means. So BCA, in this case, even coincides with the preference relation of a subset of the voters. So it's exactly the same relation as the ones uh, in this column here, um, which is not the largest fraction of voters in this preference profile. Um, but I guess yeah, that also doesn't come as a surprise because we are just counting pairwise comparisons, right? So we don't want to have a ranking such that this ranking is exactly the same for the largest amount of voters. That would be ranking ABC. But if you just compare pairwise comparisons, the ranking BCA is what gives you the highest score. Um, 
Okay, so there are maybe two things to notice now. Is first one is, and, and this is what we are going to develop, uh, and we will continue to talk about this in the next lecture. Is okay, how can we compute this thing more efficiently than what we have been just doing? So. Would be nice if we can, uh, just like in the case of, of single peak preferences, for instance, where we first had this naive algorithm which takes exponential time, um, and then we had some some more insights, and, and eventually we can just take a large preference profile and easily decide whether it's single peaked or not. It would be nice if we have something like this for Kamini's rule as well. Um, and the other thing is that we can now compare this, uh, for instance, to um, Borders rule. Um, so I think I did it at one point, and the border winner was okay. So the border winner turns out to be alternative B. Okay, so alternative B is the border winner, which in this case is also the top-ranked alternative in the Kemeny ranking, but that doesn't always have to be the case. Okay, so I, I hope uh, using this example you have now really completely uh, like internalized the definition of Kemeny's rule, and now on, on the next couple of slides, I would like to show you how we can get a better understanding of this um, without like needing to compute scores for every possible ranking of alternatives. And, and maybe one thing that is useful for this is to understand what kind of uh, Condorcet function this is. So now it, this is not really a social choice function, but a social preference function, but we could still apply the same terminology of C1, C2, C3 as we have, designed, uh, uh, have, as we have defined last week. So what kind of function would Kemeny's rule fall in? Uh, is it so? First, is it a C1 function? Does it only depend on the majority relation? Mm, clearly not, right? Um, is it a C2 function or is it a C3 function? Who thinks it's a C2 function? <laughs> okay, so who thinks it's a C3 function? No. Okay, so everybody. So it can only be a C2 or C3 function because C3 is defined by everything that is not C1 or C2. Um, C2 means it only depends on the number of voters who prefer one alternative to the other. Okay, so we had this notation NAB, where AB was in the subscript, and every social choice function that only depends on those numbers, like borders rule, somewhat surprisingly, um, and maximin, for instance, every function that only de depends on this matrix, where we have these weighted pairwise comparisons, is a C2 function. Um, and that's also the case for Kemeny's rule. Okay, so you were right. So it is a C2 function because we only need to know how many voters prefer one alternative to the other. So C3 functions really need to know whether there is a voter who prefers A to B to C to D. So we need to know the complete ranking of, of these specific voters. We cannot abstract away from this by only looking at pairwise comparisons. But for Kemeny's rule, this is not um, required. Um, and since it's a C2 function, it makes a lot of sense to, to get a deeper understanding of Kemeny's rule by looking at those weighted majority graphs that we have seen many times, so also in today's lecture. And that's what we are doing now. Um, Okay. Um, okay. So here now I'm like for the first time really formally introducing some terminology that we have been using uh, quite a couple of times. So and this terminology consists of a so-called weighted graph and the weighted majority graph. And um, I will make this precise on another slide here. Um, right. So let's let's look at this particular preference profile here. Again, the usual suspect, so you know this preference profile. And then this so-called, what we will now call, I want to make precise how we call these graphs, so this will be a so-called weighted graph. So for this graph, we just draw edges, uh, actually pairs of edges between any pair of alternatives and on these edges we write the number of voters who prefer one alternative to the other. Okay, so here we have two voters who prefer C to A and we have one voter who prefers A to C and we have two voters who prefer A to B and we have one voter who prefers B to A and we have two vo voters who prefer B to C and one voter who prefers C to B. Okay, so this, this is uh, the weighted graph, which contains directed edges between any pair of alternatives. Now maybe let's highlight those edges that are actually majority edges. And those are these in this three cycle here. Okay, so these are the majority edges and the other edges are minority edges. And now, if we 
think of the weighted graph of a preference profile, or maybe I, sh no, I shouldn't have switched back, sorry. <laughs> um, if you now think of the weighted graph of a preference profile, um, and think about Kemeny rankings, we know that Kemeny rankings need to maximize pairwise agreement. Okay, and between any pair of alternatives, we need to select at least either this edge or the other edge. Okay, so because in the end we want to have a complete ranking of the alternatives. Um, now, if we completely ignore transitivity in the output, <laughs> which, which relation would we then choose as a Kamini ranking? It's not really a ranking anymore because now cycles are also allowed. Which, which, prefer which relation over the alternatives would we choose if we just want to maximize pairwise agreement but we ignore transitivity? Yes? Exactly. So we would take the majority edges, this edge here, this edge here, this edge here. Unfortunately, the resulting relation is not transitive. Okay? But that would max it. So if we, if we slightly adjust the definition of social preference functions by allowing for, for intransitive preference relations in the output, we could just always just return the majority relation because um, this definitely maximizes score. Um, but here, um, we need to compromise. Okay? So this intransitive preference relation that you just talked about has a pairwise agreement score or Kemeny score or would have one of six um, if, if uh, cyclic rankings would be allowed. But since we cannot have cyclic rankings, we need to compromise. So we need to take at least one mi minority edge. Right? So um, do you see, what for this preference profile, one Kemeny ranking? Um, yes? Exactly. So the Kemen, so the, the collective ranking ABC has a collective score of five, right? So it's two, or it has a Kemeny score of five, two plus two, and here we only take the minority edge. So ABC would have a Kemeny score of five. Um, how about BCA? What would be the score of BCA? Same, right? Also five. CAB also five. Okay, so this preference profile is completely symmetric, right? So are they all fives? Nope. Okay, great. <laughs> so what would be the score of CBA? Exactly. So that would be four, right? Because if we have, then because then we have two minority edges. Because basically what we are doing here, so here we are going clockwise, and we are just uh, like taking one minority edge, and we can also go the other way around and taking two minority edges. Okay, so that also gives us a ranking, but ones that have a lower Kamini score. And therefore, um, the Kemeny rankings of this preference profile here are ABC, BCA, and CAB. So here, for instance, we have a tie, which is, is not surprising because this is a very symmetric profile. What may be surprising is, is because I mentioned earlier that some people argue that this is a profile which has no information, everything is completely symmetric, but here the direction of the cycle really doesn't matter. Right? If, we, if we have the cycle the other way around, then those three here would be Kemeny rankings. Okay, only half of the preference relations are actually Kemeny rankings. Um, okay, but the, the reason why I'm doing this in so much detail is, is that I would now like to use this idea and move from a weighted graph um, to a weighted majority graph. Okay, so um, a weighted majority graph, that is really something that I've already used before, even in today's lecture. Um, it's just a graph where we have one directed edge between any pair of alternatives. And the number we write on this edge is just the, different, or the difference of the number of voters who prefer the first alternative to the second minus the second alternative to the first. Okay, so we have ABC again, and then here we have only one edge. So we only have the majority edges remaining. And then the weight here is just, really let's do it in complete full detail, two minus one equals one, so that's the margin here. And here we also have one And here we also have one. Okay. Um, well, and so the main reason for looking at those here is, is because well, these graphs have a lot of edges, um, and the minority edges we automatically get from the majority edges. We know that everybody who doesn't have this preference um, has to have the other preference. And in particular, for Kamini's rule, um, what we need to do is, so I said that uh, here we have to compromise in order to take some minority edges. So that means. Uh, for instance, if we take the ranking ABC, we are taking the opposite of this here. So we're taking the minority edge here, 
Um, so basically, you can think of this as turning around this edge. Okay, so you, in order to find a Kamini ranking, you can look at the weighted majority graph and then just turn around those edges with minimal accumulated weight, because that's actually the, the score um, that, that we actually, the store, the score difference that we get if we turn around such an edge. Um, and then we want to max, so we want to, to turn around the edges with minimal accumulated weight in order to have uh, a transitive ranking in the end. Okay, so we want to get rid of all cycles by inverting edges. In this example, we only need to invert one edge, this one, this one, or this one, and then we, are, we don't have any cycles anymore, but we can do this in general. So for the three cycle, of course, this is all simple and easy, but if you, you can think of very large majority graphs, and then it becomes really not only conceptually, but also computationally, it becomes challenging, because which edges do you need to turn around in order to get rid of all the cycles? Um, so let me get back to the slide here. Um, okay, so... Kamini ranking is an acyclic subgraph with maximum weight. Okay, so this is what we have already observed. And if cyclical rankings were allowed, so this is the argument that I showed you previously, then we would just take the majority relation even if there is a cycle. But unfortunately, that's not possible, so we have to compromise. Um, and whenever we take a minority edge rather than, an, uh, than, a, uh, than a majority edge, then the then taking this edge invokes a penalty. So this is the difference of Kamini scores, and this is precisely um, in this example here where the Kamini edge is yx, this is exactly nxy minus nyx. So this is exactly the weight that we draw on these edges. This is the, the penalty that is invoked. And therefore, uh, we can look at the majority graph, which is the one that I drew on the right-hand side. And then the question of uh, finding a Kamini ranking just boils, or just in quotation mark, just boils down to the question of um, finding a subset of edges with minimal accumulated weight, such that when you turn around all these edges, um, then you, there are no cycles anymore. Then you have a transitive ranking. Okay, and it turns out that this problem is quite challenging, even if all the weights are the same. So if you have weights, of course, things are even more complicated. But even if all these weights on all these edges are one, like in the example that I just showed you, if you think about larger graphs, this is quite challenging, right? So there can be many cycles. These cycles can overlap. I'm going to show you some examples. Um, but before I show you the examples, I'm simplifying this technique uh, even further. Um, let me see whether this... Yeah, so in inverting these edges yields a Kamini ranking. So one part that is a bit, uh, maybe a bit annoying about inverting these edges is, is that when you invert, once you invert an edge, you can actually even add new cycles. So thinking about inverting edges in a majority graph is, can be a bit confusing to think about. So something that would be much easier to handle, at least for most people, would be rather than invert those edges, is just delete those edges. Okay, so if we, if we delete some edges, uh, well, then the re resulting relation doesn't necessarily have to be transitive. But if we have the goal of just getting rid of the cycles, we can just delete edges. And I'm going to show you on the next slides why this is formally equivalent. Maybe some of you already see why this is the case, but it's, it's not completely obvious. So the next step that I would like to make is look at this weighted majority graph. Um, and then, um, rather than turning around edges with minimal accumulated weight, just delete edges with minimal accumulated weight, such that in the resulting graph, there are no cycles. And once we have such a graph with no cycles, then we get the complete Kamini ranking out of this graph. Um, okay. And in order to show that uh, inverting edges and deleting edges is equivalent, we need to prove this little lemma here, um, which Basically, it's really just a graph theoretic statement. Okay, so I'm, at, I hope so that all of you have heard about graph theory to, to some extent in discrete structures and hopefully also in other courses because many concepts that will follow us in the next lectures will be just based on weighted majority graphs. Um, and the statement here says the following. So we have a directed graph. So sometimes these edges are also called arcs, um, but here I just refer to them as edges, but it's still a directed graph. And then there's some subset of vertices and then this, the claim here is, is that we can make this graph acyclic by inverting a subset of edges in E prime, if and only if deleting all the edges in E prime makes the graph acyclic. Okay, um, so basically this really shows that inverting and deleting is the same thing. The only important part here that, or maybe the part that also you bothers you a bit is that we are talking about a subset here, <laughs> but this is really necessary as we will see um, for this statement. 
Okay, so, but the statement is just, so we have some subset of edges. The graph can be made acyclic by inverting some of these edges. And this is the case if and only if the graph is acyclic if we remove all of these edges. It's an if and only if statement, um, so we are proving both directions. First direction is completely trivial, or quite trivial, and that would be the direction from left to right. Okay, so if a, if a graph can be made acyclic by inverting a subset of these edges in E prime, so think of the original graph, then we are inverting some of these edges, and then the graph is acyclic. Okay, and now we want to show that removing all these edges that we have inverted also makes the graph acyclic. Okay, but after we've inverted all these edges, we have an acyclic graph, then we remove all these edges, and then of course the graph is still acyclic. By removing edges, the graph cannot get cycles. Okay, so if it was acyclic to begin with, after having inverted these edges here, and now if we remove all these edges that we have just inverted, the graph is still acyclic. Okay, so that's, that's the direction from left to right. Okay, so that's, that's the easy direction. Um, and the other direction is, is that we have a graph and some subset of, uh, of edges, E prime, and removing all of these edges results, uh, if, we, if, we remove all of, if removing all of these edges results in an acyclic graph, we can also remove a subset of these edges, so this is where the subset becomes important, to get a graph uh, that is acyclic by inverting those edges. And um, let's see how this argument works. So here, how we go from right to left is, so we have this edge set E prime, um, and now, so the, all these edges in E prime are removed in this graph here. Yeah? Now we add all of these edges one after another in random order, it doesn't depend which, the, the order is arbitrary. We add one edge after another, um, and we orient it, so there are two ways to orient an edge. So it, originally it's a directed edge, but if we can orient it, we can turn it around or just leave it the way it was. And for each of these edges, we orient it such that there is no cycle in the resulting graph. Um, and if an edge cannot be oriented without having a cycle, well, then the previous graph was acyclic, which is a contradiction. And let me show you why this is the case. So I think it's, an, it's a nice little proof. So we had a, we had a graph that was um, acyclic to begin with. Okay. And now we have one edge that we need to add. So it, con it can go from top to bottom or from bottom to top. And now this argument would fail if no matter how we actually add this edge to this graph, there will be a cycle. Okay, and if this is the case, um, that means um, that, so this is a path. <laughs> there has to be some path like this and some path like this because that means if we draw the, an edge this way, we have a cycle. And we, if we draw the edge the other way around, we also have a cycle. Okay, if, if this would happen, then there's no way how we can add this edge. However, in this graph here, which was the graph which was assumed to be acyclic, we have a problem because this graph already has a cycle. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's really as simple as that. So we cannot add an edge like this, um, and therefore, um, the proof from right to left works. Okay. Um, so maybe let me also show you examples why this subset thing here is important. So th the subset thing is important because sometimes we add new cycles by inverting edges, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so for example, okay, so there, oops like two pretty drastic examples. So for instance, we can have this graph here, which contains a three cycle, and this red set of edges here is the set E prime. Okay. Okay. Um, so, and now, if we, um, we, it's now about the direction from right to left. Okay, so if we remove all the edges in E prime, the graph is acyclic. Sure, it, it doesn't contain any edges. If we invert all the edges in E prime, well, then there's still a cycle. It just only goes the other way around, right? But the statement here is still correct because we only invert a subset of the edges. Okay, so just any one of these we can just um, invert, and then we have we, are, we have we are rid of cycles. Um, another example would, for instance, be this thing here, which is not as extreme. Um, that E prime contains all the edges. 
Um, okay, so here, if we remove the red edge, the graph is acyclic. Yes, so we don't even need to remove this edge, but if we remove the red edge, the graph is acyclic. If we turn around the red edge, well, then the graph contains a cycle. Okay, but if we remove only a subset of E prime, namely the empty set, we don't remove any edges, um, then the graph is still acyclic. Okay, so these are just examples to show you why this condition is really necessary here. Okay, but the whole point of this is, uh, so the subset thing doesn't really matter at this point, because if you think about Kamini's rule, we want to invert or, or delete the minimal number of edges. Okay, so these sets E prime that we are talking about are minimal sets. So there are no smaller sets that have the same property that make a graph acyclic. So therefore, the subset thing is not important. Okay, so we, we want to invert the lowest number of edges in order to get rid of all the cycles, or equivalently, delete the lowest number of edges to get rid of all the cycles. And, okay, so let's just remove this stuff here. So since we are only interested in minimal such edge sets E prime, um, inverting edges is equivalent to removing edges. And you can also see this, for instance, if we go back to this example here. Um, so here our argument was that for this weighted majority graph, um, we can just uh, like turn around any of these three edges, and then we get a Kamini ranking. So there are three Kamini rankings, because inverting any of these three edges will give us a Kamini ranking. Equivalently, we can just delete any of these three edges and get a Kamini ranking. Okay, so then in the result, the, the graph will not be a complete uh, relation, but it will be acyclic, so we can complete it um, in a transitive way, um, which then gives exactly the same Kamini rankings here. Okay, and that like, was uh, like a long story to eventually get to the point where we can say that um, rather than just inverting edges with minimal accumulated weight, we only need to look at this weighted majority graph. So for any preference profile, we can draw the weighted majority graph and then delete edges, um, at least one from each cycle, because we want to get rid of all the cycles, such that there are no cycles left. And once we have done this, we, we have uh, something, a graph that doesn't have any cycles, and that gives us directly the, uh, the Kamini ranking. Okay, so we have really boiled down the computational problem to this perhaps simple graph theoretic problem, right? So at first we were like looking at all the different rankings and, and counting scores, that was really tedious. Then we were inverting edges and now we are just deleting edges. Um, so for the three cycle, of course, this was completely easy, right? Be there's only a single cycle. It becomes more interesting um, in, even if you have only four alternatives, it becomes much more interesting because, well, in, in just uh, these weighted majority graphs with four alternatives, there can be more than one cycle, of course, and then these cy cycles are overlapping. Um, and then you want to, even if you ignore the weights, even if all the weights are the same, you want to delete the lowest number of edges in order to get rid of all the cycles. Um, and I'm going to show you an example for this, which, which shows why this is presumably maybe a bit uh, difficult. Um, by the way, so this idea of um, oops, <laughs> um, this this idea of uh, deleting edges in order to get rid of the cycles is really something that is uh, um, like one of these basic ideas in order to get around the Condorcet paradox. So, so many of the functions that we are discussing also in the subsequent weeks will try to get around the fact that the majority relation may contain cycles or it may fail to be transitive, which if we don't have ties, it's equivalent. Um, and then there are many ideas of get, trying to get rid of the cycles, and one simple way of getting rid of cycles is just delete the lowest number of edges in order to get rid of cycles. Okay, so there are, there are other ideas you could have. For instance, you could look at the largest induced subgraphs which don't have cycles, and then take the Condorcet winners of these, for instance. That, that we are going to define in a couple of weeks as a social choice function, for example. But now let's first look at, at this example here. Okay, so this is uh, now an example with three voters, four alternatives. Um, and in order to save some time, I've already drawn the weighted majority graph here. Um, here it turns out that the edge weights are all exactly one. Okay, so since we have only three voters, that's not so surprising because, well, the edge, if you have three voters, or if we, in general, if you have an odd number of voters, so then these edge weights will always be odd numbers. Um, in principle, we could only have an edge which also has weight three if there would be a Pareto um, dominance somewhere in this preference profile, but that's not the case. So all the edge, edge, edge weights are the same, which perhaps uh, looks like it makes the problem simpler because, well, the weights are 
not really important. We only need to look at the number of edges. Okay, because in general, we need to look at the different weights, and maybe one, weight, one edge is very heavy, so it's, it's very costly to remove it, whereas other ones are quite light, so they're cheap to remove. Here, all the edges have exactly the same weight. And now the question is, is what would be a Kamini ranking of this preference profile? And to see this, I think it's best to first try to see what are the cycles in this, in this graph, right? because we want to get rid of all the cycles. Now, who can... Well, uh, who can... Who can um, identify a cycle in this graph and just name it? So, which alternatives form a cycle here? Yes? Yes? ACD? Okay, ACD, maybe let's just draw it like this. Okay, so that would be a cycle. ABD, that's also a cycle, good. And a four cycle, yes, A, B, C, D. So I hope it's clear what, what these pictures here mean. So these are just, <laughs> I don't want to mess up the figure. Um, so these would be three cycles in there. Anything else? Which one? B, C, D? Mm, not quite, right? So <laughs> this is transitive, B, C, D. So it's B, then C, then D. Okay, anything else was almost like a trick question. So these are the only cycles. So there are three cycles in this majority graph. Um, and now, in order to get a Kamini ranking, we need to delete the lowest possible number of edges in order to get rid of all these cycles here. Okay, which possibility would that be? Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, right, so this edge here is contained in all these cycles, and then if we delete this edge, then we are done. Okay. Um, so, in the end, it, this, the problem of computing a Kamini ranking for this uh, like four alternative preference profile turned out to be relatively easy, um, but I guess this example shows you that in principle this thing can be very nasty, right? So if you have large majority graphs and all these different cycles are overlapping, um, like here they all overlap in the single edge, so that made it simple. But in general this can be much more complicated and that's why next week we will study in detail how difficult it is to actually compute a Kamini ranking. But so I think the example is clear and uh, hopefully using at least these methods we have developed so far, you are able to compute Kamini rankings of relatively moderate sized preference profiles like this one here, for instance. Okay, so and the important po point here that I just emphasized in the example is that the cycles may overlap. So if, if all these cy cycles are disjoint from another, of course, then we can just delete one edge from each of these cycles, then, then things are easy. But the problem is, is that these cycles may be overlapping and then we can just like, catch three cycles with deleting a single edge as we did in the previous example. Okay, so what I would like to show you for basically uh, the, the rest of the lecture are two characterization of Young uh, for Kamenin's rule. Um, and, and both of them are quite appealing, I think. For the first one, we need this notion of reinforcement again. Okay, um, so that's actually the reason why we have so if you recall, we are still on escape from errors in possibility, and the idea was rather than having the classic consistency conditions like alpha and gamma, for instance, we use this reinforcement condition, which has a similar flavor, but works with variable sets of voters. Um, and it turns out that Kamini's rule can be characterized using this reinforcement condition. And as, as I mentioned before the break, what's really nice about reinforcement is, is that um, it's completely irrelevant what these functions return. Okay, so here now, social preference functions we call H to distinguish them from social choice functions, which we call F, and social welfare functions, which are usually G in our case. So H are always social preference functions, but otherwise, the definition is exactly the same as the one for social choice functions. Okay, we could, we could also give one for social welfare functions, and as I mentioned, there are also ones for probabilistic social choice functions, because the only thing that we need to do is we need to take the intersection of these outputs um, yeah, and basically that's it, right? So here what this condition just says, if we have two different electorates which are disjoint, and then we apply the social preference function to both of these electorates, and there are some rankings, collective rankings, which are the outcome for both of these electorates, then this intersection has to be precisely what is selected from the union of both electorates. Okay, so it's exactly the same as you would expect 
um, when you know the definition for social choice functions. Um, however, if you think about it, um, this notion of reinforcement somehow seems weaker than the one that we have seen for social choice functions. Just because the space of preference relations is much larger than the, than the, uh, than the space of alternatives, right? So because for, for social choice functions, there needed to be an overlap in the choice sets, okay? So and in many cases, like A or B are alternatives that are contained in both choice sets. Here, the rankings have to coincide, which just on an intuitive level is, is less likely, right? Because there are so many rankings and that the rankings are exactly the same. Is, is probably less likely, and, and therefore we can do a little bit more with the condition of reinforcement, because the condition of reinforcement for social choice functions gave us the complete characterization of composed scoring rules. So that it's only scoring rules, and Kamini's rule clearly is not a scoring rule. E even though I sometimes say, uh, as I did in the beginning, we can compute Kamini's rule using the Kamini score by just coming up with numbers for each of the rankings, it's not a scoring rule as we defined it in this lecture, right? Because we are assigning scores to rankings. Um, Okay, but the condition of reinforcement is exactly as we would expect it to be. However, it, so it's, it's, it, it seems a bit easier to satisfy for social preference functions. So these conditions are incomparable because one is for social preference functions and the other one is for social choice functions, but it seems easier to satisfy because there are more rankings than there are alternatives. Um, now for the next condition, we need an auxiliary notion, and that is just that two alternatives are adjacent in a preference ranking. Okay, so we are now always talking about strict preference relations, and then adjacency is exactly what you would expect. So two alternatives, X and Y, are adjacent to each other if there's nothing in between. Okay, so if there's no Z which is in between X and Y. Okay, and using this notion of adjacency, Young then defines what he calls Condorcet consistency which admittedly is a rather strong interpretation of Condorcet consistency. I think I hinted at that at the beginning of today's lecture. So he says that a social preference function satisfies Condorcet consistency if for all preference profiles and for all collective preference relations that are returned by the social preference function and any pair of alternatives X and Y which are adjacent in this collective preference relation, the following has to hold. If X is preferred to Y in this collective preference relation, so if uh, X and Y are adjacent to each other and if X is on top of Y, then X has to be majority preferred to Y. Okay, so this function returns rankings of the alternatives and it just says something about those alternatives that are next to each other. So this, this could be a long ranking of alternatives, maybe the first choice and the second choice, for instance, if X is on top and then we have Y, then this condition says that this is only possible if X is majority preferred to Y. Okay, and this, for instance, implies that if there is a Condorcet winner in a preference profile, it has to be on top of every collective preference relation, right? because a Condorcet winner majority dominates all the other alternatives, so we, we cannot find a ranking of the alternatives where a Condorcet winner is not on top if this condition needs to be satisfied. Um, but it implies more, so it's not only about top choices. So that's why I say it's admittedly a rather strong interpretation of the Condorcet consistency principle, because you could have also uh, thought that maybe Condorcet consistency for social preference functions just means a Condorcet winner has to be on top of the ranking. But this condition is too weak. And, and this is really important to realize and, um, because there are a couple of, uh, like sometimes, oops, even book chapters and surveys um, which just mention this young characterization result and they write down Condorcet consistency as if it would only require that Condorcet winners have to be on top of the ranking. It's not that. It's a bit more than that. So we are saying that if X is ranked on top of Y, there has to be a majority who prefers X to Y. But it doesn't say anything about two alternatives that are not next to each other, that are not adjacent in the ranking. Okay, so if something is in between, could be anything. Because otherwise, if, if we would have an assumption like this, not only for adjacent alternatives X and Y, but for any pair of alternatives, then this would only work if the majority relation is transitive, which it is not in general. Um, right, and now the characterization by Young and Levenglick from 78. This one again uses an infinite uh, potential electorate. So just like the characterization of scoring rules, we need to be able to, to find as many voters as we need to. Um, and then Kamini's rule is the only neutral social preference function. Um, okay, neutrality will be defined on the next slide for social preference functions, but it will be what you would expect. So if we rename the alternatives, then in the social preference rankings, the alternatives are renamed accordingly. Um, 
And otherwise, apart from neutrality, we only, only have these conditions, reinforcement and conversely consistency. Okay, so these, these two conditions completely characterize Kemeny's rule, um, which is pretty cool. So that's, uh, for, for many people in social choice, apart from the characterization of scoring rules, this is for them like uh, one of the most uh, fascinate, fascinating positive results. So we, all, we have all these negative results like errors in possibility, but this really gives a very nice justification um, for using Kemeny's rule. And what's also quite nice about this is, is that for social choice functions, we had this dichotomy um, or, or this, what I call the dilemma of social choice. There are functions that satisfy reinforcement and there are Condorcet extensions, but the intersection is empty. And here, for this interpretation of Condorcet consistency and reinforcement, there's exactly one function that unifies the idea of border and Condorcet. And this is also what Young um, and, and Levenglick, Young also wrote some, some other papers about Kemeny's role later on, but he emphasized that these two ideas of the founding fathers of social choice finally came to an agreement. So there's one function that satisfies both of these, both of these ideas. Um, okay, so there are some things to notice here. Um, maybe first, yeah, let's go back here. Um, of course, like for all of these characterizations, um, the easy part is to show that the function satisfies the properties. <laughs> um, that we can actually just do orally now because it's, it's so simple. Okay, so it's neutral. Uh, yes, um, I haven't even shown you the definition, but so it's renaming the alternative. So there's nothing in the definition of, of Kamini's rule which really takes into account whether an alternative is called A or B or something. Reinforcement. Essentially, it's the same reason why scoring rules are satisfy reinforcement. If you think about the very first example that I showed you for Kemeny's rule, where we just counted the scores, um, if we have two different electorates and one ranking has the highest score in one electorate and one other ranking has the highest score in another electorate, if you just take the union of these, these scores just add up okay, for all of these different rankings. And therefore, if, if two rankings had the highest uh, score before, well, then these added up scores will also be the highest. Okay, so that's intuitively the reason why reinforcement is satisfied by Kemeny's rule. Condorcet consistency, which means oh, <laughs> this condition here. So if two alternatives are adjacent to each other, then if X is on top of Y, X has to be majority preferred to Y. Why does Kemeny's rule satisfy this condition? Can you get an easy proof by contradiction? So what would happen if, we, if X is on top of Y and Y is majority preferred to X? So I, I see you, but it would be great if somebody else knows as well. So by contradiction, I mean, so we can find a rank. So if, if X is on top of Y, but Y is majority preferred to Y, then I argue that we can find a ranking which has a higher score than the ranking that we are just looking at. Yes. Exactly, yeah. We just flip those both alternatives. They are adjacent to each other, so we can easily do it without messing anything else up. We just flip those two, and then we have increased the score because there's a majority in favor of the lower alternative. And by just flipping it, we have increased the score, so therefore the original ranking could not have been a Kemeny ranking. And that shows that Kemeny's rule satisfies Condorcet consistency. So showing that the axioms are satisfied is quite straightforward. Showing the other direction is really, really difficult. So um, we are not going to do it. It will not even be a tutorial exercise, no star exercise. Um, um, yeah. So usually these statements that really require a potentially infinite uh, electorate are, are quite difficult to do. Okay, so now next. Or maybe, maybe one thing which also hints at the upcoming exercise sheet, if, you're, if you have some background in graph theory, you will notice that this result already implies something interesting about Hamiltonian paths in, in, um, in, in these uh, majority graphs, right? Because there always exists a Kemeny ranking. The two alternatives that are next to each other um, always have to, be, have to form a majority edge. And that means every Kemeny ranking in this weighted majority graph gives in a Hamiltonian path. Right? Um, and uh, this is also something that you're going to show on the next exercise sheet. Okay, but now let's look at the second characterization of Young. Um, so again, like for all characterization, we need some axioms, um, some new ones. And for this one, we need an axiom that is uh, a variant of the IIA condition, independence of irrelevant alternatives. Okay, so independence of irrelevant alternatives 
for social welfare functions um, was just the condition that the ranking of two alternatives in the collective preference relation should only depend on the ranking of those two alternatives in all the individual preference relations. So everything else does not matter. Okay? Um, and here we are weakening this condition. So e even though the other one was for social welfare functions, but it, they have the same flavor for social preference function. But just saying we um, make the same restricting assumption for any pair of X and Y, but they have to be adjacent in both of these preference relations. Okay, now here we have two preference profiles, two collective preference relations, and X and Y are adjacent in both of these collective preference relations. Um, then it turns out that the, if the preferences between X and Y in both of these preference profiles are exactly the same, then in the collective preference relations, they should also be the same. Okay, and it's, if you, maybe this needs some time getting used to, but you will because this will be used in an upcoming exercise. <laughs> Um, so, the idea of local IRA is just, as the name says, it's a variant of IRA which is local in the sense that we are only using it for alternatives that are adjacent to each other in the collective preference relation. We are not using it for alternatives that are not next to each other. And otherwise, it's really exactly the same as we had for IRA. And um, since this can be used to characterize Kemeny's rule, it very nicely shows how we can really escape from errors in possibility um, by defining, uh, in some sense, a weakening of the IIA condition and then get a complete characterization of Kamenis rule. Um, so it can be shown that LIIA is weaker than Condorcet consistency. This will basically be part of the exercise. Um, then another condition that we need here um, is Pareto optimality. It's the only reason why I'm defining it once again. So we have seen so many definitions of Pareto optimality because strictly speaking, this is for social preference functions for which we haven't defined Pareto optimality, but it's exactly what you would expect. So if everybody prefers X to Y, then in every collective preference relation, X needs to be preferred to Y. So this is the natural notion of Pareto optimality. And once you have these two conditions, then Young has shown that Kamini's rule is the only social preference function that satisfies anonymity neutrality, Pareto optimality, reinforcement in LIIA. So it, it needs more condition than the previous characterization. So it really is a matter of taste which one you prefer better. The main reason for, for looking at this one is, is if you found the notion of Condorcet consistency maybe a bit too demanding, um, then we have a different set of axioms here which eventually implies Condorcet consistency. So LIIA is weaker than Condorcet consistency, but taken together with all the, these other axioms here, anonymity, neutrality, Pareto and reinforcement, it actually implies Condorcet consistency. And this is how this statement can be shown. Um, so we have a characterization that doesn't use Condorcet consistency. It uses LIIA instead. So again, the important conditions here are really those two here, and these other ones are relatively minor conditions. But here, this also emphasizes that it's quite nice that in the previous statement, anonymity was not even required. So the previous characterization only needed neutrality. This one needs anonymity on top of it. And I think here, it's really quite obvious why this is a nice escape from errors in possibility. We have replaced IIA with LIIA. It also uses Pareto optimality. Instead of non-dictatorship, we have anonymity. Okay, and then we have neutrality and reinforcement as extra conditions, and then get a complete characterization of Kamini's rule. Um, okay, so and the proof of this is an exercise and here I still owe you these definitions of anonymity and neutrality for social preference functions. I couldn't make them any smaller. Um, so it's really what you would expect, um, maybe with a slight caveat for neutrality. So anonymity is really just if you, if you change the uh, identities of the voters, then the outcome doesn't change. Um, and neutrality is also if you rename the alternatives according to some bijection here. So here I made it a bit shorter by just applying this bijection to the entire preference profile. So pi of r just means we are renaming the alternatives in the preference profile in all of these different preference relations. So it's, I think it's the natural extension of pi to preference profiles. Um, then the output should be just renamed accordingly. So the only thing that you need to realize is because that is sometimes a misconception is that um, we had for social choice functions, we had this notion of neutrality, which implies IIA, independence of infeasible alternatives. Um, and this is not the case here anymore. So this is just plain neutrality where renaming the alternatives gives you a renamed outcome in the end. Okay, and as I said, so th this may sound like it's very difficult to prove uh, because, um, yeah, so it's one of these major characterizations in this course. But the way you show this is just by reducing it to the previous statement. 
Okay, and this is also a hint in the exercise. So you can use the previous statement, you can take it as given. So that I said is, has a very difficult proof. And here, basically, you only need to show that using these axioms, you get um, the Condorcet consistency axiom from, from the other statement. That's how this proof works. Okay, um, so that's basically everything I have to say for today. And um, next week, we will continue to talk a little bit about Kamini's rule because as you may have realized now, computing Kamini rankings is challenging and it would be really nice to know if we can do it in polynomial time or if not, if we can actually prove that this thing is NP-hard. And that's um, so one of these two things we will do next week. <laughs> All right, thanks for your attention and see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>